I played 12 games of Pokemon Emerald at the exact same time. Except this isn't a normal version of Emerald. Instead, the loading zones are all randomized, so every door in this game leads to the wrong place. This turns Pokemon into a confusing, chaotic nightmare. But again, I'm doing this with one controller across 12 games simultaneously. Will I get lost in this insane version of Hoenn? Or can I beat 12 games of Emerald with map randomization? Let's find out. As I name myself Ryan and kick off the games, let me quickly explain what's going on here. The overworld of Pokemon contains doors, stairways, entryways, and pads that lead you to new locations. These are called warps, as they warp you to somewhere else. The locations you go to are called loading zones. For this challenge, all the loading zones have been scrambled, so when you enter a warp, you could be sent to any loading zone in the game. All of this randomization turns a normal game of Pokemon on its head. So, what exactly am I trying to accomplish. In order for this challenge to be successful, I need to defeat all eight gym leaders, four elite four members, and the champion in each of the 12 games. But I have to find them first, and uh, that's not easy. Also, remember two seconds ago when I said I was playing 12 games? Yeah, I'm actually playing 13. There's a secret 13th game running alongside the 12 you see, and the same inputs are going to this game. I won't be looking at this game at all, so how far will it be able to make it? Put your predictions in the comments now, and stick around to the end of the video to find out. The loading zones at the beginning of the game have not been changed. This way, we can still go through the early game, including selecting a starter Pokemon. I decide to go with Mudkip because it's a good Pokemon, but also, I know I have a Pokemon that can learn Surf. I name Mudkip GPS, since he'll be helping me to navigate the overworld, except in games one and two. Guess they're a bit old school. Just because the beginning isn't randomized, doesn't mean it's easy to get around. With a whopping 12 characters to navigate at the same time, it's often difficult to move everyone together. Synchronization is critical for this challenge. One wrong step and a game could be yeeted all the way across the map. To maintain synchronization, I've developed a few overworld tricks. The primary method is cornering, using walls and corners on the map as blockades. The walls keep some games in place, while I use the directional inputs to move the other games to the same spot. Once everyone is synced up, we can continue. My 12 little minions make it to Oldale Town, where the map randomization begins. Each of the four building doors is a warp, leading to somewhere random, like the Pokemon Center leading to Mirage Tower. This is how you make progress in this game, going to new loading zones and checking out the warps here. This creates a chaining web of cities and destinations, a chain so big I have to use a spreadsheet to track it all. This is also why I'm not using a timer for this challenge. Most of my time is actually spent tracking my locations and not playing the actual game. Every time I enter a new warp, I have no idea what loading zone to expect. I could find one of the gyms, which would be amazing, or I could find nothing, absolutely nothing. So on that note, Let's talk about the four types of loading zones. I'll find one of these four things through every warp. The first, and the worst, is the dead end. This leads me to nowhere and serves zero purpose. This warp can be crossed out. I never need to go in here again. The second type is also a dead end, but one that contains something important. This can be the inside of a gym, a Pokemart where I can buy items, or the location of a legendary Pokemon. These are called points of interest, and keeping track of these is necessary. The third type of loading zone is a location that contains more warps. Usually, this is a city, where the door to every building is a new place to check but it doesn't have to be a city, simply anywhere that contains more warps, increasing the web of locations, which is great. This is known as a hub. And then we have the fourth and final type. This could be a hub or a dead end. The difference is that whatever's in here, we cannot get to it yet. Maybe because it requires an HM that we can't use, or requires an item that we don't have. 
Maybe the wild Pokemon here are too strong, and we can't make it through without dying. Whatever the reason, we can't access it right now. So the final category is called a future Ryan problem. Can't deal with this now. I'll let future Ryan handle it. <laughs> Sucks for that guy. The four buildings in Old Dale actually lead to the four different types of loading zones. The Pokemon Center leads to a dead end in the Mirage Tower. The Southeast House leads to a point of interest where I can grab the bicycle. The Northwest House leads to a place I can't fully explore until I get Surf, and the Pokemart leads to a new hub in Verdanturf Town. With the new hub, I can now check out these doors, and the web of locations builds from here. Before I go on, I'll ask you to consider subscribing to this channel. I play Pokemon in all sorts of crazy ways, so subscribing will get you videos delivered hot and fresh like a content pizza. Now back to the game. As I continue my exploration in Verdanturf Town, what exactly am I looking for? Of course, I need to find all the gyms and Elite Four members, but that isn't my main concern right now. I need to find a Pokemon Center and a Pokemart. Right now, I only have a level 5 Mudkip so buying Pokeballs to catch other Pokemon is really important. And I always need to keep Pokemon healthy. Thankfully, the first door I check in Verdanturf Town actually has a Pokemon Center. Now I have a place to heal up, locked down. Pokemon Centers in this game also have a second warp to the upper floor. So I check this one and Boom, I'm inside Brawly's gym. The second gym has been located in no time at all. However, I'm going to be doing the gyms in order, so I'll come back after I find and defeat Roxanne. The rest of the Verdant Turf houses don't lead to any hubs, so I'm actually out of places to check here. Thankfully, back in Old Dale, I can still work my way through the regular game. I take on May, but again, navigating 12 games is challenging. So I utilize another strategy called pause buffering. By pausing the game at just the right moment, I can force some games to stay in place while I navigate the games that are behind. We get the Pokedex and Pokeballs, and now we can walk over to Petalburg City, because there are no warps required to get there. Just good old fashioned walking. I start to explore the warps in Petalburg, and find one of the entrances to the department store. This is the mother of all Pokemarts, since it contains basically any item I could ever need. But not only that, the elevator in the department store doesn't lead to a randomized loading zone. It actually takes you to the other floors. This means the department store is a hub with an additional 11 loading zones, since each stairway is a warp. This means I have another place to check once I'm done exploring Petalburg. There's a few relevant loading zones here, like Meteor Falls, a link to Fall Arbor Town, and another Pokemon Center. But in this random Petalburg house, I found a warp to the abandoned ship. The ship is a hub with a bunch of doors, and therefore a bunch more places to check. This one room alone contained both the entrances to Sydney, the first Elite Four member, and the champion, Wallace. But not only that, one of the doors leads to another hub in the Aqua Hideout, which led to both the entrances for the sixth gym and, amazingly, the entrance to the first gym. This one hub led directly to four critical points of interest. It may be called the abandoned ship, but it's anything but abandoned. With the first gym found, I can take it on right away. Mudkip has the type advantage, and is at a high enough level to defeat Roxanne, giving us the first badge in all 12 games. But my excitement ends right here, because as I make my way back to Petalburg, I must come face to face with the first hurdle of this challenge, One Way Warps. One-ways are exactly what they sound like. You can only go through the warp in one direction. To explain more, let's take a closer look at this situation specifically. When I entered the abandoned ship loading zone, I entered from this doorway here. But that doesn't look quite right. It looks like I'm standing directly on top of the door. You know how you walk through doors? This is happening because this isn't a normal door. This is the locked door that contains the TM for Ice Beam. The game registers that you don't have the storage key, so it doesn't know how you got in here and doesn't quite know what to do. It still lets you leave though. However, since we don't have the storage key, the door is locked and we can't get back in. And it's not like we can easily pick up the key since, you know, this is a one-way warp. We walked out, but can't walk back in. 
This cuts us off from everything we've explored so far. The Old Dale Verdon Turf and Petalburg hubs, the department store, the Pokemon centers we've found. The web of safe, explored areas is something I'm calling the loop. I know, if I'm in one of these places, I can get pretty much anywhere else. Eventually, this chain of cities will fully connect, and we've created a full loop of locations. But, by going through this one way, I'm disconnected from the loop. So, what do I do? Well, one strategy is using save states. Before I enter a new door, I usually create a save state in each of the 12 games. When I walk through, I could be pushed through a one-way warp. And if this loading zone contains a dead end, I wouldn't be able to walk back through. This means I would be softlocked. But by reloading the game, I'm back in the loop. And I have the knowledge to know that this warp is a dead end. Playing with save states is basically mandatory to avoid softlocks. However, save states won't help here. Reloading the game would bring me off the ship and back to Petalburg, but I wouldn't have any badges. Getting this badge is a requirement, so I'm essentially forced to go through this one way and be off loop. At this exact moment, my strategy is no longer finding gyms or points of interest. The only thing I care about right now is getting back on the loop. After exploring the ship, I realize my worst nightmare is coming true. None of the warps lead to hubs, meaning I'm stuck in a big dead end. However, there's one last thing I can do, and that's using a good old-fashioned death warp. By going to a super strong trainer and losing on purpose, the game will send me back to the last Pokemon Center I was in. However, in Emerald, the game doesn't place you inside the Pokemon Center. It places you outside. And just because I got to a Pokemon Center from Petalburg doesn't mean I was in the Petalburg Pokemon Center. I have no idea what Pokemon Center this is, but I still have to try something, so I take the death and end up in Rustboro City. Not on the loop right now, but a ton of places to check. I go building by building, exploring what's inside. If I find another hub, I usually check these warps as well, except for cities. They have too many warps and I'll come back to them later. One of the doors leads to Duford Town and another leads to Lily Cove. I also find a way to Mauville from the Winstraight House. But it's a one way since Mudkip is too low level to defeat all the family members and get back in. I also find the entrance to the 8th gym, but it's part of a one way where you drop down from the ceiling in Mount Pyre. I'll have to deal with this later. I looked around all of these cities for a while. Eventually during my exploration of Mauville, I found a warp to Mount Pyre, which led to Fall Arbor, which led back to the department store. This this directly connects to Petalburg, officially putting me back on the loop. But not only that, I have more places explored and mapped. So as I return to Petalburg, I do so with more information. Now that I've solved my immediate issue, I can focus back on my main goal, finding and defeating gym leaders. And oh yeah, I already found the second gym. It's here in Petalburg off the Pokemon Center. Mudkip is too weak to take on the three fighting type Pokemon here. So my best bet is to catch a new Pokemon. Thankfully, with access to the department store, I can buy all different types of Pokeballs. Since I basically only have money from defeating Mei and Roxanne, I can't afford too much. I initially opt for buying a few Great Balls, giving me multiple chances to catch something. I had quick access to Meteor Falls, so I thought it would be good to catch a Zubat, who seems to match up well against Brawly's fighting types. However, these Zubat are all under level 21, which is when Zubat learns its first flying type attack. Since it doesn't have that, Zubat, is kind of useless. So I switch up my strategy. I sell the Great Balls and buy one Ultra Ball in each game. I have access to Mount Pyre where I can get a guaranteed encounter of Shuppet. Since resetting is allowed in this challenge, I just reset games where I don't catch Shuppet on the first try. So one Ultra Ball is all it takes to catch the Pokemon. Now I take on Brawly, who infamously cannot hit Ghost Pokemon. By using Nightshade, a move that isn't affected by Brawly's spamming of Bulk Up, we can easily win the fight in all 12 games on the first try. That's two badges down. The goal now shifts back to pure exploration. I still have four gyms and three Elite Four members to find. 
playing with 12 games is actually beneficial sometimes. Occasionally, I'll find a section with wild Pokemon, and most of the games get sucked into a wild Pokemon encounter. But as long as one of the games makes it through, I can see where the doors lead. Then, I can just reset everyone back to the save state. I look through Lava Ridge Town without any major points of interest, but then I check Fall Arbor Town. The Pokemon Center leads right to Glacia, the third Elite Four member. These rooms are actually easier to find than gyms, because they have a door at the top and the bottom, so two times as likely. This is confirmed, as about 30 minutes later checking through Lily Cove City, the Lily Cove Motel leads me right to Phoebe, just one more Elite Four member to find. Lily Cove also leads me to the Naval Rock, where one of the ladders leads me to Norman's Gym. I also make my way back to a different part of the abandoned ship. And in this section, a stairway leads me right to Flannery. Man, the abandoned ship is full of treasure. This means we now know the locations of the 4th, 5th, and 6th gyms. But we can't take them on until we find the 3rd. There's no sight of Watson in Duford Town, but I do find Drake, the final Elite Four member. All the special trainers have been found. We're just missing two gyms. Through my exploration, I'm starting to get through most of the cities and other major hubs in this game. And here in Moss Deep, I don't find a gym, but I do find a major point of interest. This door takes me to the Aqua Hideout, specifically the room with the Master Ball. Right now, I only have a low-level Shuppet, which means I'll need to catch something much stronger if I want to take on the Elite Four. The Master Ball makes things so much easier, as now I have a guaranteed catch. The only problem is, I don't have anything worthy of using the Master Ball on. The only legendary Pokemon I've found is Mew, and at level 30, it's certainly not worth it. Since I'm not in any rush to battle, remember, still haven't found the third gym, I'll just hold off for now, and maybe I'll find something good. I keep exploring Moss Deep, which leads me to the Seafloor Cavern. With just one of my little fellas, I get over to the Northern Warp, and there, finally, we find the third gym. Before taking on the gym, I decide to finish up my exploration of Moss Deep. I was on a roll and didn't want to stop in the middle of a hub, and lo and behold, the Moss Deep Pokemon Center led me to the Marine Cave, which just so happens to be the location of the legendary Pokemon Kyogre. In Emerald, Kyogre is at level 70. With a great typing and an ability that sets up permanent rain, Kyogre is an absolutely amazing encounter. Maybe the best legendary I could have found. Without any hesitation, I use the Master Ball. Reginald the Kyogre joins the team. And look, I even got the name right in all 12 games. Reginald is, uh... <laughs> insanely overpowered. So I annihilate Watson with no problem. I go back to Lily Cove to link to the fourth gym, where some double battles allow GPS to hit level 16 and evolve into Marsh Tomp. Even though Flannery spams the move Sunny Day, Reginald has a type advantage and a 40 level advantage. So this fight is done cleanly as well. We don't even have to navigate away from Lily Cove, hitting the Naval Rock and directly into the fifth gym. Actually, directly into Norman's room. Thank you developers for not making every room in this gym an option. Reginald Hydro pumps the hell out of the normal type Pokemon, easily getting the fifth badge. Well, in most games. In game two, Reginald goes for a double edge, which leaves Slaking with like one HP, and it retaliates with a facade. I'm left with some pretty underwhelming options, but send out Shuppet as Norman heals up. Shuppet has an ace up its sleeve though, and that's the move Curse. By cutting its own HP in half, Shuppet puts a curse on Slaking, forcing it to die in three more turns. On turn one, it kills Shuppet, and spends turn two loafing because of its ability. On turn three, it kills Marshtomp, so both Pokemon die. Doesn't that mean I lose? Nope, because I still have that Zubat I caught for no reason. You aren't pointless, buddy. You did something. The fifth badge is ours, and after the battle, Wally's dad rushes in to take us to his house. Well, it's the ghost of Wally's dad, and he leads us straight through the wall. This is actually a cutscene, and doesn't activate any loading zones, meaning we actually get to go to his house. This is critical because here, we get the HM for Surf, 
Most HMs we have to find, but this one we get for free. Now I can deal with some of those future Ryan problems. The future is now. Thankfully, the exit to this house leads to Verdant Turf and not a dead end. I, uh, don't know how we'd complete the game if I got softlocked here. The sixth gym is one of the first we found, back in the same loading zone as the first gym. So we roll up and obliterate Winona. Reginald is using Surf now as he can still one-shot everything. So I'll take the accuracy of Surf over the power of Hydro Pump. At this point, I've explored every major hub, connecting all the cities into a loop. However, I still haven't found the seventh gym, which means it's hiding in the depths somewhere, likely behind a smashable rock or a bike puzzle or a convoluted and specific set of warp zones. It's time to find the unfindable gym. I found it. It was in the Slateport Harbor. Like, right through the Slateport Harbor. How did I miss this? I can surf through Tate and Liza's team, knocking out all four Pokemon in two total moves. We now have seven badges in all 12 games. Falling down in Mount Pyre takes us to the eighth gym. I'm proud of a lot of the way I played this challenge, but the thing I'm most proud of is perfectly executing this gym puzzle in 12 games. It even got a bit tricky in there, but I figured it out. Juan's team consists of water Pokemon, so it can handle Reginald's water moves fairly well, especially Kingdra, who can easily tank Surf and rest up. Thankfully, I still have a big level advantage, so I win on the first try. The gym challenge is over, and now I can focus on defeating the Elite Four. Thankfully, I found the location of the remaining five fights. Sydney can be found through the daycare, but I guess the Trick Master is hanging out here too? I hope he's not here to watch the Pokemon breed. Absolutely disgusting. Reginald can handily take out Sydney's Pokemon, even the dual grass types. Even though it's not very effective, Rain Boosted Surf from the Special Attack Titan is stronger than Double Edge, and we get a first try victory here in every game. The Lily Cove Motel sends us directly to Phoebe, and Reginald sweeps through her frail ghosts with ease. Then we head to Fall Arbor, where we appear out of Glacia's back wall. Look at me, I'm the Elite Four member now. Glacia is significantly harder than Sydney or Phoebe, as most of her Pokemon are resistant to water attacks. They also like to set up hail, removing the water type buff. For the first time all game, I actually have someone lose a fight. But I just reload and try again. And with only one game to focus on, I easily win. These Elite Four fights are so much easier than in a regular playthrough, since I can take them on individually instead of back to back, allowing me to heal up in between. In Duford, I warp to Drake, who also resists water moves. And since his Pokemon are even higher leveled than Glacia's, Drake is definitely the hardest fight we've faced. He also has a Kingdra, which quad resists water. The first attempt, Reginald dies in seven games, and I'm not gonna have success with a level 30 Shuppet, so I just reset. Two games need a third attempt, but eventually every game makes it past Drake. Now all I have to do is walk through the door and mother f That's right, folks, Drake is a one-way. We enter from the bottom of Drake's room, which is sealed off after we walk through, meaning we have to exit from the top. And this warp takes us to the seafloor cavern, blocked by a smashable rock. In my exploration, I never found the Rock Smash house in Mauville City, so I was never able to get Rock Smash or Strength. I can reset to get back to my save state on the loop, but then I haven't defeated Drake anymore. So I have to go through here. Does this mean I need to find the Rock Smash house? <laughs> Of course not. Instead, I just go over to the department store and buy an escape rope. Now, after I defeat Drake and enter the seafloor cavern, I can just use the escape rope to leave. It takes me back to Duford, the location before I entered the quote-unquote cave. With all the games beating the Elite Four, I just have one final task, defeating the champion. Wallace was one of the first points of interest I found, all the way back in the abandoned ship with the first and sixth gyms. Wallace also specializes in water Pokemon, giving Reginald a really tough matchup. However, this battle can be won thanks to... 
Healing items. Whenever Reginald dies, which does happen here, I force those games to stay in the Pokemon selection menu, since clicking A just keeps the menu open. Once Reginald dies in every game, I can achieve synchronization. It's not just helpful for overworld movement. Syncing up is great for menuing too. With all the games together, I switch into the second Pokemon in my party. Instead of attacking, I bring Reginald back to life. The weaker Pokemon get sacked, and I bring Reginald back in, repeating the process until I get through all six of Wallace's tanky Pokemon. One by one, the games start to win, allowing me to focus more on the other games. For the final game, we get down to our last Pokemon, a Poochiena I accidentally caught and named as such. With just this game to focus on, I can win as well. At long last, the final game is over, and I've defeated a total of 96 gym leaders, 48 Elite Four members, and 12 champions, all with map randomization. But wait, we still need to see where the 13th game ended up. All it takes is one wrong step to be in Evergrande City or a gym. This game could easily accidentally accomplish something. Let's see where it is. Okay, so we're in the middle of fighting a Zubat. It's level 16, so if I had to guess, I'd say we're probably in Meteor Falls right now. That's decent progress. Mudkip is named GPS 2, so we were in sync when we got our starter. It's only level 7 though, so it hasn't been doing too much. We aren't winning this fight, so let's see where we death warp to. Okay, it's... Petalburg. You know, the first major city in the game. That's uh, fairly disappointing. We clearly started off great, in sync with the other games, and then I guess broke off to do absolutely nothing for 140 hours. At least we somehow managed to get exactly one dollar. How does that even happen? Well, I hope you enjoyed this playthrough. If you enjoyed watching me tackle 12 games of Pokemon at the same time, check out another one of these videos on screen now. Also, it would be amazing if if you subscribe to the channel. I promise you won't regret it. Thank you so much for watching.